Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. In 6th century BC lived a 6 times Olympic wrestling champion, Milo of Croton. According to myth, Milo would borrow a newborn calf, lifting it each day. Over time, not only did the calf grow into a bull, but Milo grew in size and strength. Regardless of whether this story is true or even possible, it demonstrates the most fundamental component of any training program, progressive overload. Milo made size and strength gains as the calf, eventually a bull, consistently served as a high-level stimulus. It became progressively heavier as Milo got stronger. When progressive overload is a missing component from a program, that program will simply be minimally effective long-term. Conceptualizing progressive overload as a cycle works well. A challenging training session evokes muscle and strength gains. These gains enable you to apply progressive overload, and in turn, this application of progressive overload sustains a challenging training session. In the modern day, I'm not sure many train with calves or bulls. Rather, freeway and or machine training seems far more common. With these, two of the most popular ways to progressive overload are with all other training variables kept constant, increasing load or the number of repetitions performed. In this video, we're going to be analyzing a brand new study comparing these two progressive overload methods for muscle and strength. Back in February this year, some may know I released a video around a Brazilian study that had dropped at that time, comparing progressive overload via load or rep increases. Leg extension strength gains were not different between progressing through load or reps, but muscle growth of the vastus lateralis was greater for the load versus rep progression. Yet there were important limitations with this study. It wasn't a randomized controlled trial. Rather, it combined the results of two separate studies, one study that progressed with load and another study that progressed with reps. This actually resulted in the training frequency and duration differing between the load and rep progression groups, confounding things. Due to this, I previously said in the February video that better controlled research is needed to compare progressive overload methods, and I noted there was a researcher who had a study in the works. This is the study that has now been released. It's the first randomized controlled trial comparing load and rep increases for muscle and strength. Let's dive into it. Thirty-eight trained individuals were randomly assigned to a load or rep group. All subjects trained these four lower body exercises with these variables in the first session. The load group attempted to increase the load they trained with across sessions while staying within the 8 to 12 rep range. The rep group maintained the loads used in the first session and aimed to perform more repetitions across sessions on their exercise sets. Food diaries, although not always super reliable, were measured by the researchers and fat, carb, protein and calorie intake were similar between the load and rep groups. Before and after the study, strength was assessed via one rep max on the Smith machine squat and muscle growth via thickness of the mid quad, lateral quad, medial gastrocnemius, lateral gastrocnemius and soleus. Increases in virtually all muscle growth measurements were similar between the load and rep groups. Although mid quad growth tended to slightly favor the rep group, we'll discuss potential reasons shortly. Smith machine squat strength gains were fairly similar between both groups, with the low group seeing a small 2 kg greater increase versus the rep group. So overall, this study finds load and rep progressions are fairly comparable for increasing muscle and strength. Let's dissect these findings more while considering the broader literature. We noted mid quad growth slightly favored rep progression versus load progression. It's not clear why this is, but the researchers speculated rep ranges on the squat may have something to do with this. The rep group trained with higher reps on the squat in the later portion of the study, and higher reps on the squat may enhance rectus femoris recruitment, a large part of the mid quads, due to accumulated fatigue in the other vasty quad muscles. Lower reps on the squat, as done by the load group, may not involve this as too high rectus femoris activation with heavier loads may more meaningfully inhibit hip extension motions. Personally, I'm not too sure of this speculation. I think more research would be needed to verify how rectus femoris recruitment differs between higher and lower rep squats. Another explanation is the greater mid quad growth with the rep group was just due to chance, especially given growth of the other muscles was similar between both groups. Somehow the rep group might just have had better rectus femoris building abilities. In any case, this study still largely suggests muscle growth is similar between load and rep progressions and this makes a lot of sense. A wide range of studies suggest per set, 
Reps between 6 and 35 are similarly effective for muscle growth, provided those reps are performed too or close to failure. So long as you stay within this range from session to session, regardless of whether you do this by increasing load, rep numbers, or a combination of both, it makes sense muscle growth outcome should be the same. As for the strength gains, Smith machine squat gains were fascinatingly very similar between both groups. The load group saw a minimal 2kg greater increase only. Given strength is based on lifting the heaviest load you can, I'm sure many would have expected the load group to have seen much more notably greater strength gains. The lack of differences in strength may have something to do with the fact the test was conducted on a Smith machine squat. Neither group trained with a Smith machine squat, rather a free weight squat, and so perhaps this strength test was too non-specific. If one rep max free weight squat was tested, maybe strength gains would have been more notably superior for the load group. Another consideration is both groups trained with 8 or more reps. This matters as the literature suggests 1 rep max strength gains are superior when training with heavier loads that permit 5 or fewer reps, versus lower loads with more reps. The reason for this is likely that training with heavier loads and fewer reps is more specific to a 1 rep max. Thus, it's likely that consistently training with heavier loads that permit 5 or fewer reps is a great idea if your goal is to max 1 rep max strength, and progressing load is needed to effectively do this across sessions. Progressing load or reps are probably similarly effective for muscle hypertrophy. For strength, though the new study indicates load and rep progressions are similar, it's limited as it used a non-specific strength test and subjects trained with rep numbers sub-optimal for strength. In all likelihood, I think progressing load, rather than reps, is your safest bet for maxing 1 rep max strength. If you've made it here, I have a free ebook you might like. The Ultimate Guide to Bench Pressing for Strength and Hypertrophy with more than 100 scientific references. From technique to training variables to comparisons and other fascinating science, we cover it all. Grab it through the link in the description or comments.